Welcome, everybody. I'm hope, hoping you're having a good start to the fall semester. I want to welcome you to our inaugural uh, speaker of the 13th year of My Life As series. The journalism school considers this to be one of their signature programs that we offer to the university. And we have a very special speaker to kick it off to um, this year. But we couldn't do this without some very special help um, from some key sponsors who I want to thank. One is Tiller, and the other one is WSHU Radio. Oops. So tonight we're very uh, lucky to have an exceptional speaker. Her name is Laura Helmuth, and she's had an exceptional career in uh, public health and scientific reporting and editing. Um, at the moment, she is the editor of the health and science section of the Washington Post. Uh, she has worked as an editor at some of her most prestigious scientific magazines, such as the Smithsonian, and National Geographic. She has been honored with the presidency of our premier science writing uh, association, the National Science Writers um, Association. Um, she has served in a number of distinguished advisory boards, including the Society of Science for the Public. And she has a PhD in neuroscience from UC Berkeley. Pretty impressive. Um, Tonight, she's going to talk about how we can use science to make sense of the crazy world um, that we live in. Uh, many of this is very topical, especially in New York, given the um, what's going on. My students laughed at me this morning when I said this uh, word three different times. Couldn't get it right. But the vaping crisis that's going on among young people today uh, the vaccine measles crisis that we had uh, last uh, summer and last uh, uh, winter. All these are very um, timely things. So her, her appearance is, uh, is uh, it's got a good news hook, as we say in the biz. So um, I will welcome to the stage Laura Helmuth. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Got my little slides going. Yeah, so I'm the, uh, the health and science editor at The Post. I've been there uh, for three years. Uh, you may have noticed at about that time we got a new goth motto, democracy dies in darkness. So things, things have been pretty serious at the Post lately. Um, I got hired in May 2016. And when I was interviewing, one of, the, uh, one of the pitches I made is that, look, people's interest in politics kind of goes in four-year cycles. Pretty soon, this um, election will be over, and we'll be moving on to other things. And we can talk about you know, discoveries, and space, and black holes, and dinosaurs, and evidence-based health, and things like that. And, um, we are doing those things, but we're doing a lot more because um, interest in politics didn't simmer down. Uh, this is um, the President of the United States uh, two nights ago on a Saturday night, uh, enjoying his relaxing weekend by tweeting about how the Post is the enemy of the American people, and we make up facts, and we make up sources. So um, this has sort of changed our game, changed how uh, uh, mass media organizations um, do what they do, how we explain what we do, and that includes how we do our health and science. It's had a lot of influence on, on what my desk does. And uh, the, the main thing we're doing is trying to show our work more. Um, and this, it, we, we've been doing this in a lot of ways, um, some of it explicitly, just telling people, okay, this is how journalism works. This is actually how an anonymous source works. And this article is by uh, Margaret Sullivan. Did anybody go to see her, um, her talk last year? Was anybody there for that? Yeah, she's great. She's basically the conscience of journalism lately. Um, she's been just really smart about saying how we need to handle this new reality 
um, when there's just a lot of misinformation and what, what's our responsibility and how journalism needs to evolve to, to be more clear about what's true and false and to say it plainly. Um, so we're doing that. We, we're uh, in, in our regular stories, we're kind of moving up and amplifying our explanation of how we know what we know. So showing our work, saying, you know, we interviewed, uh, you know, 17 people who worked in this department. We got these documents, some through FOIA requests, some through public records requests, um, and just telling readers very explicitly, here's how we know what we know. Um, we're also trying to be more transparent about what's a news story, what's perspective, what's opinion, what's first person, what's analysis. And um, so we have little drop down boxes that explain what a perspective is. Um, unfortunately, I think the people who know enough to click on a drop down box probably are already pretty familiar with the distinctions. So I'm not sure how much this does, but we're, we're basically trying to be more transparent. Um, and then we're doing a lot more fact checking. Everybody is. Uh, it's now a holiday in April. Uh, international, it's not just in the US, International Fact Checking Day. It's a thing. I'm not sure how you celebrate. We should have had a cake. Um, and the, the Post, uh, was anybody here for uh, Glenn Kessler a couple of years ago? He's the, the main fact checker at The Post, and he, he did one of these talks too. And he's been doing a lot of fact checking. He's had a busy couple of years. He's got uh, a few more reporters working on his team now. Um, so we're doing standard fact checking. But then um, we had to come up with a new, a, uh, a new category of, um, of fact checking. Oh, there we go. Uh, for uh, falsehoods that are repeated 20 times or more, uh, even though they're demonstrably clearly false. So we had to introduce the bottomless Pinocchio, and so far Trump has earned 20. Uh, actually, I think it's more than that. That when it was introduced, he'd already earned 20. Um, so. We're trying to evolve, you know, trying to, uh, to, to keep up with changes in the public discourse. Um, and this is, uh, I think, something that science journalists in particular can help with. We have just a lot of experience with dealing with some of the problems that like political and other reporters are dealing with right now, um, which is that uh, I think science reporters were some of the first to recognize the problem of false balance, that there aren't two sides to every story, or there aren't two legitimate sides to every story. So um, particularly with like evolution, we don't quote creationists when we're writing about the evolution of some trait um, that, that's not, not an alternative point of view, and it's not really worth representing in most cases. And it's the same with climate change. Um, you can disagree about what to do about climate change, but the science of it is completely comprehensively proven. Um, and the same with vaccines, uh, the moon landing, we really did land on the moon. So there's a lot of kind of conspiracy theories or, or kind of false dichotomies that, um, that science reporters have a lot of experience in, in dealing with. And we're good at debunking, um, we're good at uh, explaining evidence, uh, and, and analyzing evidence, deciding you know, how strong some, somebody's evidence is, uh, deal with a lot of conspiracy theories, chemtrails, we're dealing with that right now. Um, and know how to manipulate statistics. So uh, some of the skills that science reporters have, we've been, uh, my team and I have been trying to, you know, kind of distribute throughout the room and, and, and it just kind of ex explain how our standards are a little bit different and, and we've dealt with some of these problems in the past. And then another thing we're doing is um, sort of at a meta level, uh, explaining the science of misinformation and disinformation. Um, and this is um, like your news literacy program, which I think is fantastic. Uh, the goal is to empower readers to recognize uh, when there's false information and be able to, to fight it however they can, either in their own minds and also in their, in their social circles. Uh, so we do a lot of reporting on, on how false information spreads through the media. Um, and then uh, also some of the psychological phenomena of why it's so appealing. And uh, this, this is a story about, a, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is this really robust psychological finding that the less somebody knows about something, the more confident they are that they really understand it. Uh, and so this helps explain why politicians who do not know what they're talking about, or anybody who doesn't know what they're talking about, can be so convincing. Because as far as they're concerned, they know, they understand the situation perfectly. And, um, and they'll be happy to explain it to you ad nauseum. Uh, and then we, um, we try to show also the scientific process. There's a lot of, you know, as mistrust is, is growing in a lot of ways, certainly mistrust in, in journalism, mistrust in the political process, um, there's also some evidence that people are becoming more mistrustful in a kind of partisan way of scientists. 
And part of it is that it's true, you know, one day you read that coffee causes cancer, and one day you read that coffee doesn't cause cancer, you know, with your blood pressure, or coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you. And so um, we've been trying to do more stories sort of about the process of science and why it is that a sort of iterative, self-correcting, um, process, you know, and nutrition is really hard to do because you don't have uh, control groups. You can't say, okay, you drink coffee for the rest of your life and you don't. Uh, there's all of these kind of confounds. So we're trying to show like the work of science too and how, how they do their work and why it's not nefarious. It's really, uh, they're just trying to get to what's true. And um, a lot of what we do, uh, and this is I think what we kind of feel most strongly about is, is help people um, defend themselves against kind of dangerous quackery uh, and information that is not just wrong and misleading, but potentially you know, damaging to their health. And um, you know, one of the problems in the US is the, the FDA doesn't have a whole lot of power to stop, uh, it, with vaping we'll talk about too, the FDA doesn't have a lot of power to um, to stop people from offering various treatments even though there's no evidence for them or in some cases evidence that they don't work. Um, and I think people don't really realize that and so they assume if a clinic is offering and, and giving great advertising for some miraculous cure that there, there must be something there. So we've had a series of stories about stem cell clinics and uh, so there is a legitimate uh, line of research on stem cells, which have you know, a lot of potential uh, to, to fight various diseases, but they're all in very early stages of, of uh, research. Um, but there are clinics, there's more than a thousand clinics now that will promise to cure um, multiple sclerosis, autism, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, osteoporos osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and um, it doesn't. It doesn't do any of those things. There's no evidence whatsoever. Uh, so it's complete quackery, but it's, it's very expensive and some people have actually been harmed by it. So we've had a series of stories on this. Uh, we've kind of been on a kick. We're kind of not letting it go. We've got more coming up too. And, and explaining both that these things don't work and that the government has not been able to stop it from, from hap stop them from practicing. And then, um, you know, as, as you all know, um, you know, one of the, the big battles in sort of national awareness, certainly in public health, in journalism, is uh, getting good information to replace bad information. Um, and the anti-vaccine movement has been very successful lately, and they've been uh, kind of changing their tactics depending on what, uh, what communities they're targeting. Um, in Texas, they're more libertarian and talk about how the government can't tell you what to do with your children. Uh, in other places, they, they make religious claims about vaccines. Um, they're, they're really very, um, very tricky, uh, very hard to fight. And so as you know, we've had some like, completely preventable and unnecessary measles outbreaks a couple of years ago uh, in Minnesota, and then as you all know, um, here in New York, so we had a, a lot of stories about that, and it's um, in, from a lot of different angles, kind of explaining how the anti-vaccine movement works, why it's so appealing, obviously why it's incorrect, uh, what we do know about vaccines, and uh, yeah, you know, it's whack-a-mole. You keep trying to, uh, to bat down um, some of the, the false claims, um, but also try to help people find new ways to think about it. And uh, one, of the, one of the kind of more unusual things we did is, is cover a, a situation where a, a pediatrician's office had a kind of a routine back to school. Uh, you know, be sure and get your shots updated. You know, they didn't even think about it. It's just you know, what you do when you're a pediatrician to save lives. Um, and they got attacked by some anti-vaccine trolls. And so they, in real time, tracked where the trolls were coming from and, and found their, you know, kind of found the, uh, the, the trail back to some secret Facebook groups. And they did a really nice job of, of uh, kind tracking how the whole movement happened, just to give a little insight into how the anti-vaccine movement is um, not some like genuine expression of concern, although there are people with genuine concerns, um, but that it's, it's very orchestrated, it's, uh, it's very targeted, and they're just really good at it. And um, so that's, that's a way of kind of helping people understand how the misinformation works. And then, uh, you know, there's new conspiracy theories all the time, and you think you've fought one, and you've won, and then you haven't. Um, so just, this is from February, just like last year, scientists started noticing, and, and you know, people who pay attention to pop culture started noticing that people were talking about the Earth being flat, and they, they weren't joking. Like, they genuinely think the Earth is flat. And, um, 
and this idea, you know, which had basically you know, been a, a fringe, like super isolated, kind of also almost like a sign of mental illness belief was, was becoming fairly widespread. And um, sure enough, it was YouTube that was uh, allowing, the, allowing these ideas to, to become so powerful. And not intentionally, it's not like YouTube woke up and said, let's you know, make people believe this ridiculous thing. Um, but because of the way their platform works, because of their algorithms, because of the way if you search for something that's not true, all you get is the stuff about it that's not true. Like there's, there aren't a lot of articles, or there weren't, saying, no, no, no actually the, the earth is round. And we didn't think we needed that. And so every, everything was just about the flatness. And it was monetizable. Like these, these things went viral and people went down the rabbit holes. Uh, and so the idea started spreading. Um, this is just a tweet that I thought captured last year really well. 1990 scientists, we cloned a sheep, we landed a robot on Mars, and scientists today, for the last time, the Earth is round. <laughs> it's just gotten worse. You know, we, we think of, you know, that science and civilization just keeps getting better, and it, it's the arc of justice is not bending in the right way. Um, but things do get a little bit, bit better when, uh, when scientists, when journalists start reporting on this problem, you know, eventually YouTube, uh, de you know, they didn't deplatform the uh, the flat earthers, but they demonetized them. They like removed the incentive for these videos, and so eventually now it's it's much harder to find them, and they don't pop up, and they don't auto populate. If you're just looking harmlessly at something else on YouTube, that's not going to like pollute your feed. Uh, but you know, it's too late. Like there's all these people who believe it, um, so it's really hard to to take an idea like that back. It's just kind of constant constant work. And uh, I have to say the um, the platforms have also responded really well to anti-vaccine things. Again, it's too late, but Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, uh, all the all the major platforms have uh, in Google have um, have squished the anti-vaccine messages. They're 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 they've tweaked their algorithms to to kind of su suppress those messages. So that's good. Um, so just uh, one thing on the vaping. Um, has everybody heard about the vaping related illnesses? Are you guys familiar with that? Okay, good. Yeah, so for the time being, just avoid especially black market um, THC products. Even THC products you can buy in, in like legit shops. Um, looks like they're being adulterated with an oil that can cause a deadly form of pneumonia that you know, can kill you overnight. So just don't vape for a little while. We're hoping to know by the end of this week what the products are, so just be super careful in the meantime. And so this is one thing we can do in the media is when the CDC says, uh, a lot of people are sick and we've never seen this before. Like we can really amplify that message and yeah, hopefully save people from, from like really dangerous experiences. And so a lot, of, a lot of what we think about and a lot of what I think about as an editor is how do we make our real health and science stories based on evidence um, based on legitimate reporting, uh, based on honest interviews and, and you know, clear evidence, like how do we compete with the nonsense in the world and the, you know, the conspiracy theories and the viral videos that are just based on fantasy um, and don't have to abide by actual rules of reality? And so a lot of what we do is try to compete to make our information as interesting as misinformation. And so um, some of what we do is basically adhere to formulas. So does anybody like to read mystery stories? Anybody? I love them. I mean, they're so satisfying, right? Like you start out with somebody's dead and there's a set number of suspects and there's clues and you figure it out and it's just very satisfying. And then there's like an answer at the end, which is just great. And so we use this formula for a really um, successful series at the Post called Medical Mysteries that always start with some mysterious illness Doctors are flummoxed. Um, usually it's a heroic parent that figures it out. Um, it's, it's totally formulaic, but the formula works, and so we use that formula. And uh, there's other things we can do to kind of make our stories stand out. This is a story I edited back when I worked at Slate Magazine. Um, just an example of whenever you can have a headline that says, the worst such and such ever, like, you know, who's not gonna click on that? I wanna know what the worst marine invasion ever was. And then uh, in first person too, this is an example of both because the, the writer is a biologist who said, I can't believe what I saw, um, which is just like, it's kind of a cheap um, strategy that you see on commercials sometimes. Uh, so it's, it's something that works, but you know, so we use it. And then lists. 
Um, you can get people to read just about anything if you say it's the top 10 of whatever that thing is. Uh, we're very predictable, and, and this isn't some online thing. I mean, BuzzFeed, uh, you know, kind of perfected the form, but this is something that's been in magazines since magazines were invented. Um, people like lists. There's something about it that's just really satisfying to being able to enumerate something. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, when you're covering health and science, sometimes there's just legitimately a story that is just delightful and, and awe-inspiring and mind-bending in all the right ways. And uh, so did, did anybody see the, the black hole coverage? Um, this was uh, over the spring, this was in April. And this is something that we knew had been coming for a while. Like we knew there was gonna be a picture of a black hole, but then to actually see it was just really, really satisfying. And this was one of our most popular stories of the year. Um, and it was, it's just a reminder that sometimes, you know, people really enjoy the joy of discovery. Um, the scientists certainly, the reporters do, the readers do. Uh, so it's not always like that. It's rare that we have a story that's just that exciting, but uh, it's, it's a delight when we do. And then um, that's, that's, this is kind of an occasion when everybody was like, yay, science, that's great. Um, but sometimes science is much more uh, kind of judged against. You know, there, there are some people who, um, you know, find some science either silly or offensive or troubling in some ways. There's lots of different, you know, like obviously fetal tissue and there's some other, you know, kind of culturally divisive types of science. Um, but sometimes there will just be a random scientist that gets, uh, you know, trolled by Fox News for um, what they do. And so one of the effective ways to deal with that is to, is in a first person sense for the scientists to sort of humanize themselves and say, here's what I do and this is why. Um, so a few years ago, uh, Fox News found out about this research on duck genitalia, which is fascinating. Um, ducks have a have corkscrew-shaped penis and a corkscrew shape in uh, vagina, and the female can can determine whether the um, whether her eggs are fertilized or not because of the way the the corners work. Um, it's really cool, and there's video. Uh, so I highly recommend you see it. But it, it, basically, this poor scientist um, was was you know, getting all kinds of threats and harassment because the National Science Foundation was funding this dirty research. Um, and so she wrote an article for me about you know why actually this is a really interesting evolutionary question. And just by uh, you know spelling it out and being sort of good humored about it, that really diffused all the hostility toward her. Um, so if, if any of you um, are scientists or no scientists, if you ever get in trouble, just write a first person article, laugh at yourself, it's, it's really uh, disarming. Um, so there's, there's things all of us can do to kind of improve the ratio of sense to nonsense in the world. Um, and especially on social media, are, are many of you on Twitter uh, or Facebook, um, Instagram is not as big a deal, but especially on Facebook and Twitter, uh, if you see misinformation, you know, especially if it's somebody you know, it's really effective to just say, hey, here's a link to a Snopes article. This is actually not true. Those airplane tracks are not chem chemical poisoning. Um, we really did land on the moon. Um, and here's a link. So, and then sharing real news, uh, just especially um, Facebook's algorithm right now is uh, depressing news stories published by news publishers. So like if the Washington Post shares a story, you probably won't see it on your news feed. But if your friend shares it, you're more likely to see it. So if you read an article that you think is, you know, interesting and legitimate, uh, sharing it definitely helps. And um, yeah, especially, you know, a lot of it's one-on-one. -on -one. People don't trust anonymous scientists, but they trust their friends. So uh, that's how a lot of like bad viral misinformation spreads is, you know, legends uh, get passed along by a friend and so you think they're trustworthy, but it works also for real, real news, real information too. And oh, for all the students in the room, uh, the Washington Post has an internship. The deadline is October 9th for this upcoming summer. So, so apply, yes. Listen, yeah, say that again. Apply. <laughs> apply. It's a great internship. It's, it's very, you, you get a, a huge range of experience. Um, they take it very seriously. And that's all. So that's how you can find me. Uh, feel free to get in touch with story ideas. If you have story pitches, if there's things you think we need to be covering, uh, feel free to get in touch anytime and, and have questions.
Good evening again. So I'm going to ask Laura some questions, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience. Um, Laura. Yes? What do you think is the biggest uh, science story today that's going uncovered? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's not uncovered. I mean, I think you know, climate change, especially this week, is getting attention. I, I think it, you know, it's the story of our lifetimes. You can't have too much attention to it. Um, but I think the, uh, the loss of wildlife is probably not getting the attention it deserves. And we did get a burst of attention for the bird study, um, but it's, it's just catastrophic, like the loss of habitat. Uh, you know, climate change is part of that, but, uh, but I, you know, I'm a bird watcher, so I have strong feelings about it, but I think that's, that's probably the thing that, that's changing most dramatically in our lifetimes that we're not really aware of. Um, why is the anti-vaccine myth so persistent, do you think, oh, yeah. that you've learned? What does it have to teach us about the way people understand and digest science news? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with how we understand risks. And part of the problem with vaccines is they're so successful. Like, I've never met anybody with measles um, or, you know, the whooping cough. And so, like, the, the danger of the disease seems so abstract. And thanks to herd immunity, it mostly is. And so I think the, you know, the thing you're protecting against is hard to imagine, hard to envision. And, you know, needles are scary and children cry and, you know, it's your baby. And, I remember yeah. very well from my childhood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think, and, and then the, the anti-vaccine movement has been, has had some really uh, effective communicators um, who are just liars and monsters, um, but they're really good at what they do at, at scaring people. What's, do you see on the horizon, are you getting signals of what's next in terms of uh, something like the anti-vax movement, you know, these things tend to, they thrive on the next thing. So this kind of yes. has run its course, right? What do you see on the horizon that's coming next? What's the, the most persistent or biggest new myth that's coming down the pike? Yeah, that's a good question. There's so many. Um, the, the chemtrails really seems to be picking up steam. What, say this again? Oh, yeah, chemtrails. So, um, so there's this idea of geoengineering that as climate change gets really bad, we need to try some, you know, think about, just think about um, potentially, you know, seeding clouds with something that would be reflective to block some of the sun's heat. Um, it's all at the very theoretical stage right now. But the, the, the chemtrails conspiracy theory is the idea that when, you know, when you see exhaust from planes, that that's full of mind-altering chemicals that the government is drizzling all over the world. And so whenever you do a search for um, geoengineering, what comes up is the chemtrails conspiracy theories. So that's, they're, they're like the new flat earth. I think they're, they're poised to do that. And then with health, there is just so much bad misinformation out there about um, you know, homeopathy, uh, chiropractic, um, you know, the idea that you can you know, starve your cancer by not eating sugar or do eat this. Like, it's just really, it's really awful and dangerous because then people are making health decisions, right. bad health decisions. Is there something that's common across all these myths? I, you mm -hmm. know, when I hear you talking about these various things and think back across my lifetime, I wonder, is there a consistent pattern that makes these myths take hold, whether it be the anti-vaxxers or, uh, you know, this secret cancer cure yeah. that will, you know, yeah. if I eat a sugar cube every day, I'll, yeah. is there something that's consistent across all these? I mean, it seems like, it seems like what the conspiracy theories have in common is like a simpler explanation for something that's a little bit intimidating. Um, so there's that, like the idea that, oh, you know, I don't need to get chemotherapy and radiation therapy. I can just, you know, eat grapefruit or Himalayan bath salts. Um, so it's partly that, uh, like it's partly a, a simpler, like more satisfying or more um, comforting uh, solution to something that's, that's complicated. Um, but I think it, there's also, like there's, there's been a lot of sociology of the people, especially with the flat earthers, like some, some really nice uh, so, so, uh, social science research on, you know, who are the people who are attracted to this, uh, who really take it seriously and try to spread it. And there seems to be like some common psychological um, characteristics and part of it is like a need to feel superior. 
uh, like, you know, you sheep don't know the truth about, you know, you're, you're buying into this United Nations plan to, to fake it that the earth is round. But I know that Antarctica is actually an ice wall that's keeping the oceans in. <laughs> and so it's like a sense of superiority and, and being in on a secret thing. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So I dr dream of being the next great science writer for the Washington Post. What would you recommend I do? I'm in college now. That's oh, yeah, my good dream. Question. Yeah. How do I get there? What would you recommend? That's a really good question. Um, so if you if you have, I would say, so I'm a big fan of auditing classes. I mean, you're in a university. They're excellent. Well, not right now, but like <laughs> at any you know, from eight until five or seven every day. There's just brilliant lectures being given all the time. So. Uh, I'm a big fan of just auditing. Just, you know, go sit in. If you want to know, if you think you might cover space sometime, you don't have to take it for credit. Just sit in on the class, listen to the lectures, get some familiarity with what's exciting in paleontology or astronomy or evolutionary biology. Like, take advantage of being at this great university. Um, go, to, go to the lectures, uh, you know, talk to people in different majors, and um, just, you know, find out as much as you can about, like, what's really hot in science right now. So how about, um, so once I get out of college, is there a certain good path to follow if I'm an aspiring journalist and I want to go into science writing? Talk a bit about that. Yeah, that's a, so the, um, there are programs, there are like master's level programs that specialize in science writing. Um, so NYU has one, MIT, University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, Boston University, so there are some definitely specially programs, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, you know, getting internships is also a really good way to just learn the business without having to pay for another few years of college. Um, and you can also freelance. Uh, there's, a, there's a much bigger freelance market for science writing than there is for most other kinds of writing. Uh, and it, it just so happens that there are a lot of, uh, of, of journals of, sci of science magazines and science publications that take a lot of freelance work. So um, you can join the National Association of Science Writers. And uh, the student fee is, I think, 20 or $25. And uh, that will give you access to a lot of other science writers, a lot of advice about starting out, about how to pitch stories, where to pitch stories. Um, and then another really good resource is a, a website called The Open Notebook that has a lot of just practical advice for science writers. Is Science writing a field that's growing, super competitive. How would you characterize it? Yeah, that's for a good young question. People? I mean, I think compared to some other <clears throat> kinds of journalism, it's relatively healthy. Um, it's, and I wouldn't say it's growing overall. We, you know, we've lost a lot of the regional science reporters, um, but there are some, you know, a lot of online publications that are specializing in science. Um, and then, of course, there's other career paths. There's, uh, you know, working for museums. Um, public information officers. There's a, a lot of uh, career paths that really value being able to explain you know, complicated concepts well, you know, with any kind of technological concept. So yeah, there's a lot of, lot of career options out there. Um, what's the most challenging or difficult myth that you've had to take on to refute as an editor? Oh, good question. Yeah, there's so many. It's hard, it's <laughs> it's hard so many to keep to them all straight. <laughs> How about recently? Yeah, recently. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let me think about that. What's the cigar that she wrote? Oh, the cigar, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, two aliens, yeah. Yeah, we, um, can we go off the record for a minute? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, kind of silent as it's being recorded, so sorry, style section. Um, our style section ran a story about how aliens, it's aliens, and it's not aliens. Um, they didn't run the story by the science desk first. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, if you, if you search, you'll find the wrong story. Uh, but basically, it's an, a, an asteroid that's, uh, that had a really, I mean, we, there's asteroids all over the place. But usually, they come from the asteroid belt. And, and they're sort of predictable how they're, they'll move. But this cigar-shaped asteroid is zipping through the solar system like really quickly and on kind of an odd trajectory. And so astronomers like trace back, well, where must it have come from? And it looks like it came from outside the solar system, uh, which means it's the first known thing outside the solar system that we've, that we've um, detected. So that's really cool, right? Like that should have been the story. And we did do several stories about 
how cool is this that there's an asteroid right outside the solar system in our solar system? And those stories got some, you know, traffic. They did fine, but then our style section did a story about how, and it's aliens. <laughs> and that got all the traffic. Yeah, of course. Um, we've been talking about journalists, but this is really, science writing is a collaborative effort of mm. working with scientists. Is there something the scientists could do to help journalists uh, combat these myths? What yeah. could they do better? Well, they could all take training at the Allen Alda Center, <laughs> which is excellent. <laughs> Yeah, I've met so many scientists who've taken trainings at the Allen Alda Center, and they, it, it's life-changing for them. It's amazing how, how big an impact it has in their ability to sort of understand their own work, understand their community, understand how to talk to the world at large. Um, so yeah, they can definitely do that. There's also a program called Compass that does training for scientists. Um, but I think just the, well, first of all, answer the phone or answer the email. If a journalist calls or emails, like, you got to respond right away because they're on deadline and they don't have time to wait around. Um, but just, you know, being willing to talk to reporters is, is really Do important. Do you find that there are there three things that, that scientists need to work on in particular to improve their uh, communication skills and winning the trust of the audience, what would you yeah. recommend to them? Yeah, definitely, so like metaphors help, especially if it's something that's not visible, if it's something really small or really big that you can't envision, it really helps if, if they have a metaphor that just helps people sort of, not necessarily completely understand it, but like feel like they understand what the science is about, that really helps. Um, and then just be human, like, you know, <laughs> talk about why you care about what you're studying or, you know, what puzzles you or why you got into it in the first place, just anything to, I mean, it's, it's not fair. Like, scientists shouldn't have to prove they're human. Like, everybody should have a default assumption of being human. Um, but if you look at, like, Pew does all these uh, surveys of people's attitudes, and they, you know, if they have all these uh, attitudes about scientists, and intelligent, hardworking is up there, but then, um, you know, easy to relate to and able to communicate are all, you know, way down there. <laughs> so um, it's not fair. It's just a complete stereotype. But, but that's a problem with stereotypes is you've got to address them. Is there something that journalists need to work on in talking to scientists and drawing them out and communicating their work? What are, say, the three biggest flaws in what we do now as journalists working with science? Yeah, I think like one thing that it's, it's really important to do is just let your pride go. And this is true for science reporting or any time you're reporting on something that you don't understand, like just be the dumb one. Just uh, embrace that you don't understand it and you don't know what the words mean and just keep asking questions until you do understand it. And that's really hard to do, especially when you're starting out and especially when you're in college. I mean, half of what you do here is fake like to understand what's going on. Um, and that, you know, you, that doesn't end actually with college. Um, <laughs> we're all faking it most of the time. Uh, so that's, you know, just be willing to ask the questions. Just there's, abandon all pride is really important. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, as you say, it's, it is collaborative. You know, ask, ask the scientist, like, what metaphor do you use? How do you explain this to a child? Um, you know, and, uh, and, and try to make a human connection. And also, if they have any favorite jokes or puns, like bad jokes are good too. Because <laughs> science, you know, still, like, a lot of people are a little science phobic or feel like, ooh, I, you know, math was my hard subject. So anytime you can have kind of goofy humor that's, very um, welcoming and you know, kind of breaks the ice for people if it's a subject that they're intimidated by. Very good. So <clears throat> at this point, I want to throw it open to the audience. There are microphones on either side. If you would walk up to the microphone, and I'll go back and forth if people want to ask questions. This young man right here. <laughs> uh, I think, hi, thank you so much for your thoughts, and I really appreciate it. So I'm not sure why the style section, that the post style section has a long and great legacy, I know. But I think science should be more front page news. But I think also your point about, um, uh, my, my, this is the, my question, is you, I think your point about the, um, uh, the superiority com you know, or inferiority complex also has to do with the misunderstanding about what science is, is that it's probabilistic. It's, it's, it, you'll never get anybody, any scientist, say for 100%. Mm -hmm. Even the black hole story that you noted was uh, mm -hmm. you know, something that 100 years after Einstein had proposed that it was possible, it took that long 
to prove the theory. And I, I wish that there was some way that you could explain the basics that science, you know, even your, your area of neuroscience is, it's probabilistic. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to definitively prove something. So I'm wondering, how do you get past that misunderstanding about what constitutes good science? Yeah, no, that's, um, that's, that is something we're dealing with all the time. Uh, and yeah, and it's tricky too. If you, you know, if you're t just talking to a scientist and you ask them about something, they'll say, oh yeah, that would never happen. And then if you go back and fact checking and say, would this never happen? And they'll be, well, you can't ever say never. Um, right. So there's like a, you know, they're very aware of the probabilistic nature, but for, for the purposes of communication, that just gets in the way, because then people are like, oh, there's a chance, um, even when the, the chance is infinitesimal. So yeah, that's something we, you know, try, try to explain, and, and we have to make judgments about when does it make sense to say, you know, this is 99.7% sure, or we're just sure for the purposes of now. This young man. So while going through your uh, science degree, how did you end up uh, deciding towards science journalism instead of some alternate path like research or academia? Yeah, it's, uh, I came to it late. Um, I was, uh, during, uh, during my grad school, um, my advisor went on a sabbatical and I was like starting my dissertation. I thought, you know, I could use a sabbatical too. So I, I wrote for a travel guide for a summer and it was like this epiphany of, oh, writing is fun. It's even more fun than science. Like I really enjoyed science. Um, but then I realized, oh, I guess I can write too. And so uh, then I started sitting in on a whole bunch of other classes and sitting in on journalism school classes and uh, realized I had a knack for it. So it was just sort of a, a as a lot of things are career-wise, just sort of a chance. Thank you. Thanks. Matt. Well, hi. Uh, what do you think is the biggest hurdle facing scientists trying to communicate today? Because I know you've spoken a lot about how experience theorists spread bad information or uh, people don't understand that uh, scientists can't say never because there's always that infinitesimal chance. Yeah, there's a, a lot of challenges. I, part of it is, you know, as, as any field progresses, what you're working on becomes more and more focused and more specialized. So I think it's, it's hard for people to kind of step back and say, you know, here's what I'm doing in a nematode, but this is the bigger picture question. Um, and that's, that's just hard to do. You know, thinking back to some earlier controversies like uh, do cigarettes cause cancer, oh, yeah. I think what was really helpful in putting that to rest was identifying the Tobacco Institute and the cigarette companies as being the nefarious groups that were using shells to yeah. communicate this, this fake science. And as I'm thinking about the vaccine stories today, they're almost always focused on individual communities, mothers, saying, why do these people at the end of the road leave these things? And should journalism, uh, especially by the major newspapers, be more invested in trying to root out where these things are coming from? Who, who is the mysterious Facebook outing them? Uh, these people thrive, trolls thrive on secrecy. And maybe if their names were identified, the sources of funding were identified yeah. and publicized, this would make a much bigger impact than we're having right now. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We had, um, we did identify some of the funders of one of the anti-vaccine groups. Uh, and then we've got another story coming out, I hope in a week or two, about Joseph Mercola, who's like a quack from way back, um, and how he's been involved in the anti-vax group and, and is, is profiting is from the it. Brit, the, What's that? The Brit, the two, there's uh, a that's father Wakefield. and son. Oh, Wakefield. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if he's British or not, but he's, he's another one of the, um, uh, you know, let me cure your cancer with this quack cure type of person. This young lady. Hi. Um, regarding the recent climate strike on September 20th, do you think that more than the actual protest itself, the articles that were published after by like the Washington Post would actually have an impact um, more so on the policy change for government? Yeah, that's a, it's a tricky one. It's, it's been impressive. Um, like, the, the marches really do a nice job of, of drawing people's attention, and partly, um, you know, they're so visual. So the Post covered them, but, but more importantly, like the TV networks covered them. And uh, I think, you know, the, and there were some really interesting storylines. And, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg, you know, she's, obviously she's not the only person, but she's kind of a stand-in for the whole youth movement. Um, and I think that's really captured people's attention. 
And the, you know, the, the line from attention to policy change is not direct at all. But you kind of can't get to policy change without the attention. So it seems to be the first step. Um, and we saw this with the science march too uh, a couple of years ago that you know, people coming out en masse for marching for science, which never happened before. Um, and it really seemed to galvanize support for science and prevented a whole bunch of budget cuts that had been proposed, and also kind of gave people more a sense of community, like we're in this together. And so I think it was energizing for activists too. And then also the signs, like the signs are funny. And uh, so some of our, especially during the science march, some of the stories that got the best traffic were, these are the best signs from the climate march, or the best signs from the science march, because um, they're just so funny. And it's, it's so nice to see the actual people and you know, the kids with the clever signs. And it's, it's just really good, um, good communication. So the conspiracies that you were talking about before, how would you say it would be the best way to contain those conspiracies to the point, but like before they go like nationwide where people are actually believing it? Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one because you know, debunking can backfire sometimes. Like if, if there's a conspiracy that's sort of bubbling over here and you say, no, that's wrong, um, then it just sort of amplifies it and more people are exposed to the conspiracy and could potentially believe it and pass it along. So there's been a bunch of social science on it, and I think probably your um, news literacy class might get in this a little bit. Um, but basically, you have to replace the false belief with a true thing that's that's more engaging or you know more understandable, and um, and avoid repeating the falsehood and uh, explain where the falsehood came from. Um, you know, especially it's really it seems to be really effective, especially with like middle school and high school students explaining, you know, this is where this message comes from. They're trying to manipulate you. Um, this is why. This is advertising. They're trying to, to, to you know, tweak your emotions and mislead you. Like those kinds of things can empower people to, to not believe something that otherwise is so enthralling. Uh, but it's, it's hard. There's, it's really hard to compete with, with a good viral conspiracy theory. Like, they're just so catchy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. It's been incredible to listen to you. Um, I'm wondering, what's your process for distilling sort of more complex studies or scientific topics to make them accessible so people understand um, on a broader level but maintaining the scientific accuracy? Yeah, that's, that's a constant challenge. And sometimes, especially if a subject is really complicated, uh, what I tell my reporters is use really simple words. Like use the smallest possible words. Use really short sentences. Like just explain every step, you know. Do you um, hear that, my 115 class? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, so really simple language. Graphics, if you can use them. Uh, sometimes a, an FAQ or a Q&A format works really well. Um, to sort of acknowledge that people have questions about it. And we've been doing this with the vaping, like what is this vaping illness? Why, why do we think it's new? You know, what's the evidence? Who's been sick? Um, just in kind of a bullet point, you know, so, so it's even like short sections, so you can just kind of go to what thing you're curious about. And it sort of acknowledges, you know, that, that format implicitly acknowledges that, yeah, this is confusing. People have a lot of questions, and you're not alone by like being just confused. Um, so that, that kind of explainer format can, can be really effective, too. Hi, do you think fake news in the health and science can be much more dangerous than in other topics? Yeah, that, I mean, I think sometimes it can. I mean, especially when it comes to people getting, um, like, avoiding proper medical treatment if they're sick. Uh, that seems to be, like, the most direct impact. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's not obvious that if you think the earth is flat that that really like, harms your long-term well-being, but definitely in the medical realm, like the, the thinking that you can, you know, that you can meditate your, your illness away or something, like it's just, that, that seems like legitimately dangerous. This young lady? As editor, you probably read through a lot of articles before you um, allow or contribute to allowing them to be published. How do you know if they're interesting or impactful enough? Yeah, that's a good question. And you know, we're, we're constantly learning. And also, so the question is what, you know, what makes an article interesting? And it changes all the time. Um, like there, people will go through phases where they're really interested in space or they're really interested in dinosaurs. And then we'll see like, you know, that the, the, the kind of 
intellectual market, the you know, mind market is a little saturated and then you can't get somebody to click on a dinosaur story for a while. So there's kind of trends, just like with fashion, there's like trends in, in what, pe what subjects people are interested in. Um, and you know, the, the things, and, and then part of it too is what people are interested in is something that's surprising or different. So as soon as you, you know, identify something that's new and surprising, people will read about it, but then it's not new and surprising anymore. And so then you have to find the next new and surprising thing, and it's just a little hamster wheel. <laughs> <clears throat> when it comes to like new or recent scientific information, how much can you try to extrapolate from like its recent prevalency, and if new information were to come up, how much does it change for writing on it? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's tricky with science because it's all iterative. So um, we we've kind of gotten away from covering single studies because so often you know they don't replicate or the statistics are a little fluky or something. So now what we, what we try to do is uh, whenever there's a new study that seems to be worth covering, use it as an occasion to write about a whole field and kind of bring in you know, everything that's been published. You know, in the past three years, scientists have come to realize and then talk about kind of the bigger field instead of relying on any given experiment. And that's, that's kind of a new thing. That's, that's how the field is evolving a bit. Sean? All right. Uh, in a world where algorithms are pushing these misleading and fake stories on people, if the news media had the power to use its own algorithms and push their stories above the misleading ones, would this be considered an ethical balancing of the scales or a compromising of the news's integrity? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we're not we're not above it. We'll, uh, you know, the, okay, it's, like it's a constant battle. Um, like in search engine optimization, like you know, if we do our keywords right and we do our headlines right, maybe the Google News bots um, will you know search our site and, and you know will surface if somebody just searches for something. Uh, it's a little bit harder to tweak um, Facebook algorithm, although it is now, but we used to be able to tweak it all the time. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I, I don't think anybody would have compunction about doing whatever we could to get more attention for our stories. Uh, and if that, in, ideally, less attention for the, you know, baloney stories. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't have that power yet, but we use whatever power we have. <laughs> Andre? Hi, good evening. Um, in the emergence of uh, futurists and uh, computer scientists talking and warning about artificial intelligence and the change that it's going to bring in the coming decade, do you think that the uh, media and news outlets should be weighing in and talking about this more, or do you believe that it's overblown? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's um, it's really interesting, and you know, with AI, um, especially in the healthcare realm, like, that it's always been one of the sort of test cases: is can they diagnose, uh, you know, disorders better than doctors? Can they, you know, perform surgery better than doctors, and, or you know, read um, read X-ray scans or something? And it really seems to be the case that for a lot of health applications, uh, it, you know, it is getting to be, you know, better than and what human doctors can do. Um, so yeah, we try to cover that a bit. As far as like the catastrophes um, and our new alien overlords, uh, we haven't done much with that, but uh, the technology department at the Post um, definitely plays with those ideas more and, uh, and tries to stay on top of like, you know, what can an AI really do? And, and then of course the, the social problems of what you train an artificial intelligence up on um, they learn really well whatever they're taught, and so if we teach them biased things, uh, which humans are ridiculously biased, then they just amplify those biases, and so there's all kinds of interesting social science questions there, too. Sarah? Hi, Laura. I'm, I'm going to adjust this first. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, I'm Sarah Ruberg, and I'm really, this past year, I've fallen in love with environmental reporting, and I'm curious because environmental reporting and climate change has really been reported on since like the 80s, 70s. Um, how you continue to keep a new angle on yeah. climate change and keep it interesting, even after decades it's been being reported on. Yeah, that is the challenge of our careers, is to uh, help people understand climate change and help them pay attention to it. 
Um, and you know, the challenge is if something is just unremittingly grim, it's really hard to get people to pay attention. And a lot of environmental coverage is like honestly and genuinely grim. Um, so like that's, that's the thing is to find, to find new stories. So when I uh, worked at Smithsonian Magazine, we had a really nice uh, climate change article that um, brought in Henry David Thoreau's journals and how you know, current scientists were looking back at his journals where he kept track of when did these flowers bloom and when did the first birds arrive of various species and, and found that there was like a 10 day shift in basically when spring happened and it was happening earlier. And this was at the time for Smithsonian Magazine and so a lot of the readers cared about literature, cared about travel, cared about history. And so it's basically finding ways to, to push people's buttons um, and sometimes with climate change, like new characters will do that. Like Greta is, is a really good way to get people to pay attention because she's, you know, so distinctive and has such a passionate message. Um, but basically any, that, that's the constant search is to find ways to get people to pay attention in a fresh way to climate change. Thank you. Uh, hi, a uh, bit of like a weird question. Uh, but do you think the editorial process changed ever since uh, Jeff Bezos like bought the post? Yeah, it didn't actually. Um, so our, our business side changed. Uh, he put a lot of support into what we call engineering. So basically um, the, the, our content management system and um, like how quickly, you know, how efficient we are at publishing. Uh, so if you're on your phone and you load a Washington Post story, it pops up really quickly. Uh, which is very good for um, traffic because then people don't wait for it to chug along and just decide, oh, I don't want to wait for that. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, like back end things that he improved. And then he's been involved in some of the decisions about um, the digital paywall and you know how, what techniques we use to get people to subscribe digitally. But it has nothing to do with the actual editorial, either the, the news reporting side or the opinion editorial section. Um, he stops by the office every once in a while, and you can tell when he's there because everybody kind of sits up straight. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff's here. Um, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise we don't even see him. Hi, Laura. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you faced at the Washington Post as a writer, and have you ever covered a story that you didn't want to cover? Oh, good question. Yeah, we, we don't, it's rare that we're pressured to cover something that we don't think we should. Um, and. That's, that's kind of my role as an editor is if a reporter, if, if somebody, usually my boss, says, you know, why aren't we covering that? Like if there's a good reason why we're not, then it's kind of my role to report, to, to protect my reporter and, like, and keep them from getting kind of pushed into covering something that their in their judgment either is not accurate or is not something we should be shining a light on. Um, but it's hard and there's a lot of internal pressure to you know, to cover things that might get a lot of traffic or that, you know, grab the attention of my boss's boss's boss or something. So yeah, it's a constant negotiation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for being here. Um, with so many anti-vaxxers, um, particularly the Orthodox Jewish community, they use a religious exemption from to, um, until, you know, this point where the law, you know, enacted now so they can't do that anymore but in your field is religion kind of treated as fake news <laughs> yeah because no, it's yeah. I, it feels like the same time you're talking about uh the earth being flat and aliens you bring up a lot of interesting points that could be applied to religion you know people have this baseline belief and even if you deny it, it still comes back. And I mean, religion is so institutionalized that I feel like nobody's talking and shooting down religion yeah. <laughs> as this the opposition to science. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. It's a difficult question. Yeah, it's tricky. At the, it, it totally depends on what publication you're working for. So some publications you can mouth off about religion all you want. Um, when I worked at Slate, uh, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, but at the Post, we're, we, we try to be much more respectful, um, partly I mean, for a lot of reasons, but mostly to not alienate people. Um, so yeah, we, we, we tend to be really careful. We have a, a, a desk um, a religion department, uh, like three reporters who cover religious issues. And we pretty much 
kind of let them do all that coverage, uh, which is, in a way, it's weird because then other coverage of American life doesn't have so much religion in it, um, but it's it's sort of its own section. Like, you know, science is over here and religion is over here. Does that, does that ever overlap? Like, do you ever see a subject in science and religion? Does that overlap? And does science take priority or does religion take priority? Or do you completely exempt it to the news as an editor? We often will do the same story in very different ways. So like for you know, abortion battles, especially in various states that are enacting um, you know, various like heartbeat bills or, or things like that, like the religion section will do a story about like what, what's the religious pressure there and how are the social conservative, you know, especially the religious fundamentalists, like how are they getting what they want in state capitals? And then, which is sort of a politics and religion story. And then we'll do a story about like the biology of abortion and the, the biology of fetal development and stuff like that. And they really won't overlap that much. You know, it's the same subject, but approach from two different angles. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for being here. Um, my question would be, uh, uh, how do you write an article that, how to put it? Uh, so upon, upon doing research, I've kind of been I, I would be like persuaded by my research. Uh, so uh, how can you be like objective when writing on a subject that you are kind of against? So saying um, I'm anti-vaccine, but I'm trying to write a report about like how vaccine is uh, helping people. So how can you be objective, objective at the same time make the article interesting? Yeah, and that's, um, and that's another, Part of journalism, you know, for a while, and some people still kind of do hold on to this idea that journalists are just reporting the facts. We're just, you know, reporting everything that has to do with the subject and just distilling what is known. Um, but realistically, like everybody does, can it come with with some presuppositions, with some expectations, uh, with some previous experience or expertise? And so the trick is not. Um, so much that we're just reporting the objective world as it is, um, but to be fair and to make sure that you're, you know, if, if there really are two sides to something, that you're giving the best representation of both sides. Um, but especially for science writing, like, you know, a lot of times there aren't two sides, and a lot of times the evidence will, the weight of the evidence will say that, you know, this is how the world works, even though there are some alternative viewpoints. And uh, so that's, Part of like the more experience you have covering a given field, the you know kind of the more you're able to to make those judgments. And it's it, this is where as an editor, um, like that's a big part of my role with a reporter is kind of interrogating. Do you know have they really reported sufficiently to kind of understand where you know where the evidence lies, and and how to weight it, and uh, and are we representing that fairly in the story? Um, so it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to do of your own expectation, of your own understanding to, you know, to know if you've got it right or not. So having editors can really help with that process. Thank you. Um, for the myths that you've worked with, what extent do you think that the myths were fueled by people who were just trying to be annoying or people who were just trying to be <laughs> I think a lot of it. Like, <laughs> is, compared to like people who genuinely believed in the yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think both <laughs> things are true. I think there are people who are just like, you know, let's kick at it and, uh, you know, let's see if we can stir people up. And that's kind of, you know, entertaining. Um, it, it's, you know, there's a certain way in which that is entertaining. Um, but, it, but, but, but what seems to really carry the myths is the true believers and the people who e evangelize for it and, uh, you know, have the t-shirts that say 9-11 was an inside job and that sort of thing and, and you know, really witness for it and, and yeah. identify people who are questioning reality in the same way. And they're really good at like finding like, I mean, we all are good at finding like-minded people, but like really, you know, it is sort of like a contagion, um, spreading the contagion along. We have time for one more question, Jocelyn. Hi. So how does it feel being a woman writing for science, being that science is a male-dominated field? Have you ever encountered a situation where someone has perhaps belittled you or made you feel like you didn't know what you were talking about, and how did you overcome that situation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially, not so much as an editor, but um, as a reporter, like you do have some people who are hostile or belittling, uh, especially in your early career, and they think, okay, not only are you a woman, but you're young, so you must be an idiot. Um, so, you know, that's, 
you can use that as your superpower um, to get them to say, you know, to get them to speak to you plainly. Um, you also, as a journalist, have the power to expose somebody as being a jerk when they're a jerk. Like there are things you can do in a story to reveal somebody's true jerky character. Um, what, what I try to do as an editor, um, you know, this it, it's a, it, not completely the same problem, but to you know slowly push culture in the right direction is um, we have a policy on my desk that if you're turning in a story, you can't just quote white men. Like there has to be a woman or a person of color, ideally both, in every story, um, and that's just the policy. And a lot of uh, science magazines are going that way, um, including a lot that are aimed at children. Uh, so th you know that's just just making the expectation that you know you haven't done your reporting yet if you're only quoting people from white guys from Harvard, um, and uh, and there's there's a, a bunch of uh, there's a, a bunch of places that are um, trying to set up trying to, to raise the profile of women scientists to make them uh, easier, to, easier to find, easier to quote. So there's a database called 500 Women Scientists that actually has like thousands and thousands of women scientists. Um, but it's a database that you can use as a reporter if you need somebody who's an expert on, you know, on whatever, sharks. You can look for sharks and they'll have like 50 different women you can call up for a quote. And there's another database called Diverse Sources. That's women, people of color, LGBTQ experts. Uh, it's you know, basically any, any kind of diversity you would want. Um, and it's the same way where you can, you can try to find an expert to represent like an underrepresented community. So things are you know, slowly getting better, but every, it's, it's up to all of us to do what we can. Thank you. Can I just ask one question? <laughs> I know, I know. Ask one question. Uh, Laura, for those Washington Post internships, do you get a few assigned to you? And it would, would Good it question. help, would, I, would it help our permitted. students <laughs> to identify as being particularly interested in science writing when they apply? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not on the intern selection committee. I have volunteered for it, but I have not been picked yet. Um, so uh, it's, when you apply, there are a bunch of different categories you can apply for. And uh, including the style section, uh, copy editing, video, photo, uh, reporting, um, copy editing. Yeah, I said that. Um, so basically, apply, you know, check as many boxes as you're interested in. Uh, if you are interested in science, say please do include that. And oh, and also in your cover letter, say that um, say that we talked and that I encouraged you to apply and uh, drop my name. <laughs> Drop my name, <laughs> and and say say that I particularly encourage you, and that I really want um, it's more science writing interns. And then when you do apply, uh, send me an email or DM me on Twitter and let me know. And then I'll talk to the people who are doing the internship internship evaluations and tell them to look for your name. So let us thank Laura for uh, the time. Thanks.